Here we go again in for more fun. This is Pink Blue, episode number 146. This is October 21st, 2020, inching closer to that election, hoping that after the folks are cast, cast that we can finally start breathing again, but we're marching closer. So today's episode is Rotten Apple. Now this is very interesting. I've been saying that uh, through the summer, as there's been a lot of shade thrown on the social media platforms, namely uh, Google with YouTube and Twitter and Facebook have been the ones in the pot spotlight, Amazon has really escaped a lot of criticism outside labor issues. But you know who's been silent is Apple. And I, I made this comment in an episode yesterday, and you know what? Instantly, my YouTube feed filled with Apple. Now, even more interesting, it's all, it was all about a, a, you know, over, over 11 months old, some of it older than that. So I thought it was very interesting, once again, proving who's listening. And, um, and so I wanted to bring this up. This was one that I ended up actually spending quite a bit of time researching. I don't know if you found this gentleman. His name is Lewis Rossman. He's based in New York City. And this is what initially was fed to me by YouTube. And so I, I started to look through some of the videos of this gentleman. He is just absolutely honest. You can tell he's filled with integrity. He is a good business owner. He even comes out and states the mistakes that he's made so others can learn from the mistakes. But the bottom line is he sincerely cares about his clients. And he even is, explains why his price point might be slightly higher in order to accommodate um, all issues and to provide that white glove treatment. But it, 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 it's really amazing how he has made his business decisions around you, the customer, not him, the money, the, the man who wants to grow and explode on this planet with greed. And he's just a, really a kind, sincere person. I, I got to give this, this gentleman kudos. Um, he even has been riding around on his bike in New York City showing various uh, retail uh, business places to rent that he looked at over a year ago. And I think most of those videos were even the year before that. But at the point that he did the summary, he's saying, hey, look, they're still open. And then he explained why they're still uh, not re-rented. And he went over the pricing and what they were asking, anywhere from ten to $40,000. And by the way, the $40,000 a month one was for a outdoor restaurant as we're now, and this was present, as we're now heading in towards the winter season in New York, and it's dilapidated, and they want $40,000 a month. So clearly he's stating they don't want to rent it. And why don't they want to rent it? So he's done a great job going through the financials, the lending principles, and the uh, when, when you sign an agreement in order to buy a property, a commercial property is very different than a home property. And so some diligence in, in looking into that is actually a really interesting study. I would encourage that. But that gets us away from rotten apples. So let me stay on the path here. But if you've ever walked around the city and wondered, wow, why are all these businesses closed? And they have been for years or even decades. Yes, it is part of a funky scheme. Okay, so here, let's just scan through this because again, my YouTube feed absolutely filled up with this gentleman last night. Many, many different roles. But I will point out that somebody who I watch daily, Tim Cast, I can't even find on YouTube. I have to specifically know what episode I want to look for, put in his name in that episode, and hope that I can get it to come up. It's completely removed from my feed. But this adds in. So this first one here was actually posted four years ago. Lewis keeps his middle finger high for Apple. Now this is, this gentleman is a computer repair person. His livelihood comes from repairing products. And he talks time and time again about the challenges that he has with Apple as a manufacturer and Apple's um, challenge with customer service. He even had some um, organizations do underground recording as they would go in and, and ask um, the genius bar if they could assist. And the, the response is typically, sorry, there's nothing we can do. Uh, please go ahead and just buy a new product. And there's even a congressional in um, a congressional, they got called in front of Congress, Apple did, 
And, and they said that, you know, in respect to uh, providing service of repairing products, they're losing money. Kind of pulling BS on that, 100%. But um, anyways, Lewis's perspective from being a man in the trenches and sincerely knowing uh, what can be provided and what cannot has been really enlightening for me. So thank you, you two. I really appreciate the feedback on this one. So the next one is the number one reason Apple and then we repair MacBook Logic boards. And um, he goes into that. That was one year ago, five years ago, why I don't even use Apple products. And so he goes into that. Um, Apple wants your data. Is that Apple wants your data, and I'm not giving it to them. And he dismantles Apple's PR stunt repair program. That was eight months ago. And here we've got Lewis opens new MacBook Air, immediately loses his mind. It's not even cooling. So um, Genius Bar caught ripping um, customers off uh, by a CBC News article. So they went in and, and um, just at the Genius Bar wanted to see what they would quote to fix some items. And the prices were way more than what a new item would be. And we all know that that's not cheap. So anyways, um, for any of you Apple users or anybody who, who's thinking of buying an Apple, please educate yourself. Not only are the, the products extremely expensive, they say you pay for what you get, and yes, I do have to say they're very, very high quality, but realistically, 90% of the people who are paying these outrageous amounts of money for the Apple product will never use most of the tools. So they're, they're subsidizing this. But let's, let's click further. This is again a reference to the CBC National Apple investigation. It was on, um, I think it was the fourth down uh, Lewis Rossman uh, podcast listed on the previous page, but it says the national flagship newscast of CBC News released a segment last night called Attacking the a Apple Empire, an 18-minute investigative segment where it dived into the iPhone maker's controversial business practices, including allegations of overpriced repair charges and the battery slowdown scandal. Now, we remember that. It, you know, people, when we're in our own bubble, will often think, you know, how did I create this? How am I responsible for this? Because, you know, we're naive and we, we really want to put the burden on ourselves and not point the finger at somebody else. But recall when it came out that Apple purposely bricked, which meant essentially, in this case, slowed down the battery so it wouldn't fully recharge or it took too long to recharge, or completely bricked, meaning it wouldn't even turn on anymore, to force people to buy the new Apple product. And this would be, yep, you got it, right in alignment with a new Apple release. And this is, what kind of manipulative practice is this? But Australia ended up um, uh, giving a ruling against Apple, and I believe this was in 2018, where they realized that they were charging customers, customers would come in because they couldn't charge their phones. And this was a little different than the bricking issue that I mentioned, but they couldn't charge their phones. They were plugging it in and it just, it wouldn't charge up. So they bring it in for assistance and Apple's response across the board is, I'm sorry that we, there's nothing we can do with that. It's um, the charging, um, the slot where you would plug in to make contact within the phone is actually soldered to the motherboard. Thus there's no way to, um, replace it and thus you're going to have to go ahead and buy a um, either a new phone or we offer these refurbished phones for if they are quoted 249 to 349 for a, a refurbished phone but then what Apple was doing was taking this phone from that customer refurbishing it in the back and the way they were refurbishing it is the connector known as a, a snowflake uh, a snowflake chip um, was not in fact um, solder to the motherboard it was in fact a plug-in and then just by pulling it off putting another one on they just made 250 to 350 bucks off that customer and now we're reselling their item highway rob a highway robbery is is really what's going on and abuse of your loyal customers and this is just one of the many examples of of the business practices well um in australia they ruled that um in the people's favor, and they they find Apple at nine million dollars. 
Now, if anybody looks at the SEC, which is the Edgar Filings, E-D-G-A-R, you can see any publicly traded company in the United States, financial filings and financial status. And you can tell that they have their trillion dollar company. Having them pay a fine of $9 million is a pittance. They really don't care. And in fact, beyond that, I'm not sure that they've changed their business practices. So they got, I would even say a slap on the, on the wrist, it, it barely a, a nudge. The um, Australian government got a, what I call a voluntary tax and the consumer continues on its path. So here's the next one that came up. One of the posts that Lewis had shared was very, very interesting. Now this woman is a very highly educated, in fact, I believe she has a PhD. And at some point she decided to dig into why when her phone fell in the toilet because her kids were playing with it, why she couldn't get her data back. So she started studying the iPhone and now I believe her full time job is um, getting data off iPhones that have had water damage. And, and I mean, I know that's what she's doing, but I think that's what she's doing full time now. Uh, but anyways, there was, it, she was wrapped up in the CBC um, television article there that is under Lewis Rossman's leak. But you can tell this is also a very, very sincere woman. Um, she's studied for herself. She's learned the ins and outs of the iPhone. And what she can do is recover data off the phones. Now she'll say, it, it, this isn't fixing the phone. If the phone's been water damaged, the, the data is still locked in there and it can be removed. However, you're really going to need to get a new phone. And she's also saying in no way is she trying to get around encryption or, or violate any standards. She's just trying to help those whose phone fell in a toilet get their data if it hasn't been backed up. And yet this 23 minutes is hilarious at best. But another, another issue of how strong these social media and big tech companies are she posts on the Apple support communities three times during the 23 minutes when people said that they, their phone was water damaged, how can they get their data off? Um, she posted, you know, here's a, here's a quick solution, it is possible. And every single time she proved that the Apple moderator took down her post. She not only showed it was removed from the thread, but she went into her email account where they tell you that it's been taken down and explain why. And of course the why is, is not relevant whatsoever to the post. But by the third attempt, they were threatening to ban her. And she posts exactly what she said, um, but that violated community standards. And all she posted was, hey, there is hope for you. You, you haven't lost your data. So this is very interesting why a company like Apple is not saying, yes, there is a way to get a data. Because you recall, Apple is all about privacy and security. And if you can't go in the one way that they've allowed, meaning through their security protocol, then no, nobody on planet Earth can ever access this data. Well, we've seen that not to be true many times again, and yet it keeps getting silenced. So again, YouTube, thank you for filling up my YouTube thread with this very interesting uh, information about Apple. Now this one, of course, was a little over a year ago. This was April of 2019. But I'm, there'll be a lot more coming out here. So I wanted to look here. This is a HubSpot, HubSpot blog, the marketing four minute read, why Apple fans love to wait in lines. Hint, it's not about the new iPhone. And this is written by Dan Lyons. Now I wanted to look at this because there's really a cult following here with some of these companies, and I'm not gonna go down the list, but we all know who they are. And it's not just about using the product or sharing the product with others. It's about getting out of your home, waiting in line for hours at a time, paying outrageous amounts of money when you can get a, a tool that'll more than suit your needs for two thirds less money. And yet people will, fight tooth and nail to make sure that they get the best and the brightest. And it, it to me, it's way beyond uh, keeping up with the Jones or the showmanship. There's got to be something more to this deep manipulation that is, that is causing people to act with their feet. So let me read this really quickly. 
Every year it happens. Apple introduces a new iPhone, and like salmon returning to the river, throngs of faithful fans start forming lines outside Apple stores. This past Friday, the Apple acolytes lined up for the new iPhone 5s and iPhone 5C, and Apple produced yet another blowout weekend, selling a record 9 million phones. So why do Apple people love to line up? That's a question that has puzzled me for years. Now, I'm going to pause here. Now, do you recall there was a company called TaskRabbit? I'm not positive that they're still around, but it's one of the many companies that came out where you could pay somebody to run errands for you or do different tasks for you, which is why the word TaskRabbit. And through many of the iPhone um, and, and Apple product cycles, people would pay hundreds of dollars to tax Ask rabbits, the, the individuals, to stand in line for them to get the product right away. So this is even a surcharge on top of the already very costly item, thus showing that the fee was, was not important to these individuals. There's more of a status that, that is, um, is looked at. Let me continue here. That's a question that has puzzled me for years, and apparently I'm not alone, as Casey missed it. A filmmaker created a short film trying to explore the topic. The video is embedded below, and I warn you, it might make you feel depressed about your fellow human beings. So it's called The Dark Side of the iPhone, 5S Lines. And um, here, I'm going to put the link below so you can grab that too. It's totally irrational. I spent a lot of time wondering about Apple fans and their penchant for line waiting. Because first of all, let's be clear, there is no rational reason for these people to do this. These people aren't waiting in line for food or clean water or some kind of necessity. They're waiting for smartphones. And those are not exactly very high on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Furthermore, most of these people probably have the last version of the iPhone, which usually isn't that much different from the new one. So this is not a matter of life and death. Also, no matter how much demand there is for a new Apple phone, the worst case scenario is that you wait a few days or at worst a few weeks and then just walk into the store and get whatever product you want. No waiting required. Let's also remember that you can order Apple products on the internet and the company will ship them to your home. Yes, this time things were a little different as Apple did accept pre-orders for the 5C but did not accept pre-orders for the iPhone 5S which meant the only way to get the 5S on opening day was to scan in line. But even if Apple was, had accepted pre-orders for the 5S, there would have been lines outside of Apple stores. So why are they scanning there? So again, if you want to click on this and, and find into um, the, the information, you certainly can. Um, in, in my experience with Apple, I have not found exceptional customer service. In fact, every one of my walk-ins to a genius bar for which you need to make an appointment in advance has been extremely frustrating. I walk out with um, no support whatsoever and no more information than I got on the a general Google search. It's um, it, it really it's a it's a high premium and frustration. Where if you have a, a, a an, another type of product, there's usually more individuals who can help you at less of a cost and you're not being blocked. Oh, blocked. That was the other issue that I wanted to mention here with, with Lewis. What he's mentioning here is that with most manufacturers, you can go directly to the manufacturer and buy the part. So he can buy it wholesale and sell it retail, make a little bit of a profit and, and basically keep his customers happy. But Apple has negotiated contractors with their vendors such that they are solely made and, um, and sold through Apple and Apple's own Genius Bar or Apple's customer service. And the, somebody like this, um, this repairman cannot even get the tools that he wants. And so it doesn't matter how much he wants to pay, he can't get it. So, you know, there's always a conversation, well, why don't you get a scrap phone or something that's been refurbished? But, you know, sure, that helps, although even the refurbished phones are quite expensive or, or laptops or you know all their products are but this is not a sustainable model 
when he has 10, 20, 30 laptops dropped in the same day with similar issues, he needs to be able to just contact the manufacturer, have the parts in order and um, ordered and in stock and be able to service his clients. Yet time and again, he has to tell them, look, I want to fix this. Here's the exact problem. I'm sorry, Apple retained the right to the products. I'm not able to fix it. And then the individuals will go back to Apple and are quoted an extremely high price, which um, just doesn't make sense. So I wanted to round this out, and I didn't want this to be a standalone. However, I am on my, my Twitter feed here. So I wanted to post two things. First of all, I wanted to post that um, Google just quietly removed Gmail Masonic apron logo. New logo appears when you log into your account today. Slick move. So this is what we've had for, I don't know, a few years now, I guess, as far as the, um, the Gmail logo. And it's a, a Masonic apron. There's been a lot of conversations about this over the years. But it's very interesting in this period of time and just a few weeks before the election, the announcement of the Google antitrust lawsuit yesterday, that they decide, well, they're going to skip over to a new one. Now, this one, you might link it to a number of, of issues, but I'm not going to give them the benefit. We'll, we'll see what their marketing spin is on it. But it is interesting that the breakaway of the Masonic in the light of everything that's happening. But I did want to talk about this real fast. Earlier in this episode, I mentioned that Tim Cask is somebody that I, I usually look up every day, sometimes twice a day. He's got a lot of good information that comes out. And, um, and, and uh, he's been removed. In fact, he stated that he's been um, blocked. He's done his own searches. And he's, um, so I went ahead and, and was wondering, why isn't he in my feed anymore? You know, if you watch people daily, they'll come up with suggested sites, and usually they'll list Tim Cast IRL in a line for me, and all his recent videos are up there. That's been gone for about a week. And in fact, if I type in his name and a title, sometimes I'll get to him, and m most of the time I don't anymore. And so I decided, why don't I search? my own YouTube and see what's coming up. And you know what? I, I just, I wanted to pick up the computer and throw it. I was just about the end of my wit at this point. I am, I am really out here to start shining the light, turn it on and tell the truth. And that's all I'm doing here. I'm finding, not just off the cuff, but I'm finding information based on what else is in the internet and other people have been reported crossing the data, and, and then um, sharing my experience with what has happened. That's who I am. That's what I'm doing here. And yet, let me read this post that I put on Twitter. Dear YouTube, now please note, I didn't put at YouTube team or whatever. I've, I've got that somewhere, and I didn't put it. Because honestly, I don't want to be shadow banned um, transition to blocked off the platform altogether. But it's just a notice of what's happening. So I said, dear YouTube, why can I not find my videos in a Google or YouTube search? Meaning, why am I being shadow banned? Yet when I search for pink blue and a specific title, meaning I'll put in a specific title that I know is the exact title that I have typed in for the search. So in this case, I would have put in pink blue, DOJ, Google antitrust, as an example. Nothing comes up, at least for me. But in, and I'll continue here with what I, I wrote. I put, instead, I am shown images of absolutely disgusting porn. What I saw was inexcusable. I have never searched for such on my phone. I have never clicked on such from my phone. There is absolutely no reason why an algorithm would send me such information. This is inexcusable what's happening. Also being a single mom whose son grabs onto the phone in my tools, there is no reason for this to load when somebody types in a search on any level. So I want to ask, why aren't they being sat shadow banned? Well, clearly I'm not going to get a response, but I sure hope that, that we can move beyond this. And uh, I wanted to highlight this right over here on the right side. I'm not going to bring up a separate post for this one either, but it says, what's happening? And it says, US News this morning. San Francisco supervisors unanimously passed Karen Act, a new law that makes racially motivated phone calls to 911 illegal. My response is WTF. 
There's enough laws on the book. It is clear that you can't falsely call 911. People can get arrested for that. It already has criminal implications. Why did somebody have to gather, have a series of meetings, come up with an act, approve the act? Look at how much time was wasted when people in San Francisco are really struggling right now. And besides, I'm not going to Google it to pull it up, but as I recall, the Karen noted in the New York Times post was a K-A-R-E-N. So apparently San Francisco also took the liberty to change it to a C-A-R-E-N so that it could have the name care in it. Well, how fuzzy and warm and thoughtful is that? All right, well, here we are. As we're seeing the, the, the pop-ups of all the different um, social media sites and uh, big tech control, Big tech is not only, in this case, monitoring community boards by taking off positive posts and banning people. They are bricking phones to get you to buy more. They are falsely telling you that items can't be fixed to get you to either buy a refurbished or buy the, the latest. Fraud, every different direction. And this company has made their millions and billions and trillions off you, the consumer. Again, we got to wake up. The best way to vote is, is right now going to the polls is so important, but learn to vote with your dollar. If you don't like what's out there, don't put your dollar in that direction. If you want more of something, continue to put your money in that direction. That's what keeps the society going. Not saying it's right, but that's what keeps it going. So here we go. This was Pink Glue, episode 146, Rotten Apples.